times of trouble and these times are good, they're always going to be. They rise and they fall. We take them all the way that we should together, you and me, forsaking them all deep in the night. By the light of day, it always looks the same. True love always does. And here by your side, a million miles away, nothing's ever gonna change the way I feel. The way it is, the way that it was. When I said I do, I meant that I would. Till the end of all time Be faithful and true Devoted to you That's what I had in mind When I said I do This whole world keeps changing The world stays the same Hand in hand Only you and I can undo All that we became That makes us so much more So much more A woman and a man And after everything That comes and goes around Has only passed us by Here alone in our Clint Black on a Sunday morning. Can you do that in church? Actually, you can, right? I am uh, really excited this year about the Easter offering uh, because it's going to go toward a house in Guatemala. Now, the reason I'm so excited is because we went through a period of a few years, just to be honest with you, where we do an Easter offering and we take up money for Jesus. And then we do, you know, we do an, a, a, a Christmas offering and we take up some money for Jesus. And really, we were just taking up money for us. You, you're like the early crowd, so you get that. I can say this to y'all. I couldn't tell the 11 o'clock crowd that, but I can tell you guys that. And so I just, you know, I just said a few years ago, so we're not going to do that anymore. You know, we're not going to come out and say we're taking up a you know, birthday offering for Jesus. Y'all know how old he is? Y'all aren't really with me, are you? Anyway, um, I'm just saying, so we decided we were going to do something different and that we would not let it be about us. And there's going to be times where I'm going to come out, I'm going to challenge you, and we'll have to give for things but we're just not going to use Easter and Christmas to do that. So uh, you can give your uh, Easter offering. You've got these sweet little envelopes that you have in your seat this morning. And so you can give your Easter off offering in that. Uh, you can also give it the kiosk in the lobby. Uh, you can give it by texting Easter to uh, a number on the screen. I hope it's up there. If it's not, then it's probably my fault, not theirs. And or you can go to online at springwell.org. And the reason that we're taking up this money is because we want to build 
this sweet family in uh, Guatemala, we want to we want to build them a house. There's a lady named Alma, and her two daughters and uh, and her mom live with her, and they live in conditions that we can't possibly imagine. We can't really wrap our brains around that. We really really can't. Uh, they sleep on a dirt floor. She sleeps on a dirt floor. Her mom and her two children sleep in the bed when it rains. Uh, you can imagine that it floods this little shack that they live in, and can you imagine a dirt floor? And that's what they do. Uh, Alma does work. Uh, she actually sews, and uh, she does that, and she does that for some of the folks that are in the city of Guatemala. And so I just think that it would be crucially important for us if we could just rally around this family, give them some hope, breathe some hope into this family. One of the coolest things about Guatemala for me is that we go in and we'll build a house for somebody, and you would think that the other folks in the village would kind of be jealous. You know, you'd kind of think that, wouldn't you? I mean, but they're not Americans, and so they don't think the way that we think, and so they're not jealous, but they actually celebrate with each other. And it's the coolest thing is you watch not just the transformation of one family, but you watch the transformation, really, of a whole village. And honestly, if you just want to know my heart, I hope we get through the whole village and build everybody there a house that we possibly can. And so if you would, I just want you to pray. This house is relatively cheap. $14,500 provides a family with a home. Can you believe that? And so it's not too much to ask, is it? I can't hear you. It's not too much to ask, is it? You're thinking, no, absolutely not, right? Come on. And so uh, we want to make sure that we do this so that we can love and take care of this family. So are you excited about today? Yes. How many were here last week? How many were not here last week? You should have been here last week. We're in this series, uh, for those of you that uh, are maybe here for the very first time, we're uh, in a series called Love Song. This is the very last week. We've been in the Old Testament book called The Song of Solomon, and we've talked about dating. Attraction really is what we talked about the first week. We talked about uh, communication, and last week, for those of you that weren't here, you might want to go online, we talked about uh, love making. And it, it was hot. It was hot in here. It was hot for me. Uh, when I got off the stage, somebody said, you really are hot. And I said, yes, I am. You should have to get up there on stage and say this kind of stuff. I'm just saying. But you know what? We shouldn't. I don't think that we should kind of shy away from it. But I think that we should embrace these things, especially in church, because our culture is teaching all the wrong stuff when it comes to this. And I think that it's time that we as, as the church that we begin to take this on, uh, this role on to embrace it and to teach uh, what the Bible actually says about sex. So today we're actually going to watch as these two lovebirds, uh, Solomon and the Shulamite woman, who just can't keep their hands off of each other because they're so in love. We're going to watch these two lovebirds go into the cage. I thought that was so good. You know, I worked on that. Two lovebirds go into a cage. Thank you. Brian, I don't even know what we're paying you. You, you get a raise. That's just good stuff right there. That's just good stuff right there. And so they go into the cage and they have this little, uh, little squabble. And so here's the bottom line. All couples are going to fight. At some point in time, I know it's hard to believe, but, you know, occasionally Karen and I will have a disagreement. Then I usually realize that she's right, and so we patch things up and we move on. Everybody's going to fight. Healthy couples fight clean. Unhealthy couples fight dirty. Healthy couples. Healthy couples work toward a resolution. But you know what unhealthy couples do? They just look for a victory. And I'm going to tell you what I've learned. Is that even if you, as a husband, you win, if, if your wife is not on board, if you have not worked together for a resolution, then you still lose. Some husbands should say, hey, man, or oh, me, or something. Right, right? It's true. The problem is, is if one wins, usually both lose. So what we want to learn how today is, is to have a win-win situation. So we're going to be in chapter 5, verse 2. And the woman says this, I slept, but my heart, I slept, but my heart was awake. And so she's kind of sleeping, but not, not really sleeping. She's, she's kind of tossing and turning. Y'all been there? You know, you're kind of tossing and turning. In fact, sometimes you think you kind of fell off, fell off to sleep, and then you realize that you, you haven't really gone to sleep. And so in this moment, she's kind of tossing and turning, and she's, she's wondering where her husband is, and she's thinking, you know what? I just He's not home. I wonder where he could possibly be. 
And so she's just kind of, her heart is awake. Then she says, listen, my beloved is knocking. And then he says, open to me, my sister, my darling, my, my dove, my flawless one. And so it's late and he's looking, in case you're wondering, he's looking for a little bit of, a little bit of romance. So, so y'all, y'all thought, man, is this all they do in this book? Pretty much. I'm just saying, I would apologize, but I think God's pro-sex, amen. And so how do we know it's late? It's late and he's looking for a little bit of romance. How do we know it's late? Because he says, my head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. So I read that this unique biblical expression, and it points to the weather conditions in this particular part of, uh, of Israel. See, especially in the late summer, heavy dew descends around midnight. So it's midnight, and he's looking for a little bit of romance. And some of you are probably wondering, oh, pray tell, preacher, where did you come up with he was looking for a little bit of romance? Hello, did you hear what I just read? He said, open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. Are y'all with me at all? And so she says, I've taken off my robe, must I put it on again? I've washed my feet, must I soil them again? And so in the Hebrew, in the original language of the Old Testament, if you're wondering what this means, if you break it down, if you take the Hebrew and if you just break this down, what this means is simply this, I have a headache. He's coming in, he's looking for a little bit of romance, and she's not in the mood. She's a little bit irritated. Now, I understand that she's irritated, but, I mean, he's the king for Pete's sake, and he's got to do the king stuff, right? He's got to take care of the kingly business. Does that kind of sound familiar? Sometimes we do have to take care of business, don't we, folks? Right? There, there are bills to pay. There's, there's a boss to please. There's people to manage. There's some type of customer crisis that has to be dealt with, and it has to be dealt with today. You can't put that off until tomorrow. And the ordinary stresses of life can absolutely be an obstacle to a love relationship. Let's just be honest. They can be an obstacle to any kind of relationship. But what if... The occasional thing becomes more of a lifestyle. So right out of the gate, we see what maybe be, at least in the top ten, maybe the top five, maybe the top two or three causes of marital conflict. And that is simply this. It is unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. So she's tossing and turning. Why is she tossing and turning? Because she's expecting him to be home right after work. And he's not home, and so she can't sleep. And so she's a little bit anxious, and maybe she's wondering where he's at. And, I mean, he's the king, and she understands that he has a kingdom to run. But, but he, you know, I mean, where, where is he? I mean, why, why didn't he call? Why didn't he at least text? Why didn't he, you know, send a messenger to let me know that he was, that he was going to be late? And so there's these unmet expectations. And so when he comes home, he's remembering, like, chapter 4. He's remembering chapter 4 where she was like all night long. <clears throat> it's, in the, it's in the book. It's in, read the book. It's in the book. And so, I mean, have mercy. We talked about that last week. And so he's looking, he, he's, he's looking for the twin phones. <laughs> he's wondering if the petting zoo is open. That's good right there, isn't it? That's pretty, that's pretty good stuff like that. And if you missed that, that's, that's from last week. You'll just have to go back and watch last week online. So anyway, she's saying in very clear terms, nope, the zoo is closed. And it may be closed for a while. And so she expected him to be home earlier, and he expects her to understand that he's got a kingdom to run that he had business to take care of, that there were things that he had to do, and, and he meant to send a text, he meant to make a phone call, he meant to send a messenger, but he got caught up in the details of the day. And there were, there were big business to take care of, and so he just expects her to understand that. She expects him to be polite and courteous and to let her know. 
One thing's for sure. He has totally forgotten the importance of approach, hasn't he, ladies? Maybe he thinks that a marriage license is, is a license to do whatever he wants. You know where I've heard this most, this whole thing of we're married, you're my wife, you have to submit? I've heard it in church. I've heard that in church more than I've heard it anywhere else where suddenly somehow some man is being able to, to take a, 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 a verse of Scripture and maybe twist it a little bit and think, we're married, woman. Your body is not your own anymore. It belongs to me, and therefore you should submit and do whatever it is that I ask you to do. However, what we forget is that our role as a husband is to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So she said, I've taken my robe off. Must I put it on again? I've washed my feet. Must I soil them again? My beloved thrust his hand through the latch opening. My heart began to pound for him. Huh? I, what? I rose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers were flowing, with, uh, were flowing myrrh on the handles of the bolt. Now, I don't know about you. I slowed down right there. Does it, something seem to be just a little bit odd? Does something seem to be a little bit off? I mean, a few moments ago, she said, hey, dude, I got a headache. And the next minute, she's like, come here, you big old stallion. I mean, is this like crazy? I mean, when you look at this, and here's the thing. Sometimes what we do is we read through Scripture way too fast. And you read this, and you, and you know, if you're a man, you're thinking, what is the deep theological truth here? What is this thing? Is there something in the Hebrew that will allow me to be able to, to glean some truth so that my life might be set free as a husband? There is, and that is simply this. A woman has the right and the power and the prerogative to change her mind anytime she wants to. And the women said, amen. That was funny right there. <laughs> there you go, let's move on. I opened for my beloved, for my beloved had left. He was gone. My heart sank at his departure. I looked for him, but I didn't find him. I called him, but he did not answer. And so she changes her mind. And she's got this, uh, this, this myrrh on her fingers, and she opens the door, but he's gone. And so one of the things, if you don't learn anything else, is that timing is critically important, isn't it? When he was willing, she was not. When she is willing, then he's gone. And I think that happens in every marriage. One gets frisky, and the other gets a headache. One feels romantic and the other's got to watch the ball game. I mean, it is the final four. And so she, she, uh, she changed her mind, but now he's gone. And if you, uh, if you read forward, it's, it's kind of a, a disturbing portion of Scripture. So let me just kind of summarize what happens. She goes out looking for him, and she can't find him. And for whatever reason, these, these watchmen, these guards, they see her. And maybe they don't understand who she is. Maybe they don't understand that if she's out there looking for him or she's out there looking and plotting against him to be able to kill the king. I'm not really sure. Maybe, maybe they're just unsure of who she might be. But if you read this scripture, they hurt her. They hurt her physically. And they hurt her, they hurt her emotionally. So now I want you to see something that I think is powerful. And that is this, is that something that can start, all, start out in a marriage is, is small and insignificant can lead to something that's big and damaging. And it happens all the time. I've been in the ministry a long time, and it's rare that I sit down with couples that have the big, huge problems. It's usually the small things, like... You know what, he's late. And when he's late, he didn't respect me enough to be able to send me a text. He doesn't, he doesn't respect me enough to be able to, to give me a phone call just to let me know that, you know what, he's going to have to work late. There's going to be a couple of hours late just to let me know. Because now I'm worried. I don't know where he's at. I don't know if he's been in a wreck. And so I'm confused. Or it, will, it might be something as simple as this. Is, you know what, 
I'm sick and tired everywhere we go that we have to be late because one wants to be on time. And if you're like me, if you're on time, you're late. Hello, is anybody else out there? Not at Springwell, not very many, let me just say. Most of you guys love being late. It just seems like it's kind of who we are. But for me, I mean, to be late is, that's just not who I am. So I can know over the years, there literally been times, I remember when Karen and I first got married and I pastored a little church and I'd have to give up, get up early on Sunday morning like I do now and I would drive about 20, 25 minutes to church every day and, and Karen was always late and used to drive me nuts that she was late. And it's interesting, isn't it, how sometimes that somebody can be late, but now they're always late? You're never on time. You're always late. Or maybe it's that one of you spent money and you didn't tell the other one about it. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a lot of money. It was the fact that you spent money and didn't tell your spouse. And now there's a problem with trust over one little issue of spending 5 or $10 that you just didn't tell them about. And the point is simply this, if there is a conflict, a small conflict, even a little misunderstanding, deal with your stuff. Talk about it before it turns into something big. And I think most of the time what we forget when we're fighting is simply this, is that my spouse is not the enemy. Karen's not the enemy. Your husband's not the enemy. Your wife is not the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You don't have to be that spiritually in tuned to be able to look at the family today and to realize That there's an enemy and his desire is to destroy your marriage. His goal is to wipe out couples and families and to split families. And so that there's my kids and her kids and our kids and all of the confusion that goes with that. And if you don't don't believe there's going to be any confusion with that, then just simply wait. Well, just wait till the holidays roll around. And then try to figure out how you're, going to, how you're going to negotiate where to go and what to do. And so oftentimes we look at my spouse, I think my spouse becomes the enemy when we have an enemy and his name is, is Satan. Look at the divorce rate among Christians and non-Christians. You know what dis- disturbing to me is at least over the last few years as I've tried to do a little study and look at this, that the divorce rate among Christians actually according to some people, is slightly higher than non-Christians. Well, that's scary. So non-Christians are looking at us and they're thinking, dude, like Jesus is supposed to be all that, you know? Like you're supposed to model the life of Jesus where there's love and there's forgiveness and there's compassion and there's mercy and there's grace. And, And you know what? You guys aren't very merciful. You're not very gracious. At least you're not to each other. I mean, you treat your neighbors pretty good, but you're you're horrible to one another. There's an enemy. And he wants to destroy you. Let's read on. She says, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you. If you find my beloved, what will you tell him? Tell him I am faint with love. Now she obviously didn't stop to think. Right? It wasn't her fault. I mean, he, he, didn't, he didn't call. He didn't text. He didn't send a message, right? It, it's not her fault. It's his fault. He, he should have taken the initiative, you know, and, and then he comes home. Ladies, can you believe this? He comes home. It's midnight, and he wants to get frisky. How rude is that? Hello? She should have stopped to think. Because now that we're processing this whole little scenario, she's starting to look like, uh, let's just be honest, like she has no self-respect. She's starting to look like she's, you know, maybe a pushover. Because what she should do is she should be standing at home saying, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be right here and I'm going to wait till he gets back. And when he walks through that door, I'm going to let him have it. And yet she says, I am faint with love. 
It's crazy. He should be the one begging for forgiveness. And you know what? I guess you could look at it like that. That's the way most people would probably look at it. And you know what the scary thing to me is? I was talking to somebody this week who was struggling in a marriage. And you know what they told me? He said, you know what? Some of the worst advice that I've gotten has actually been from other Christians. What? Yeah. See, it's your choice to either harbor resentment or to make peace. And so you've got to make the call whether you're going to go after him or you're stubbornly going to insist for him to come and apologize to you. Gary Thomas once said, a good marriage is not something you find. A good marriage is something that you work for. So she goes to her girlfriends, these daughters of Jerusalem, and some of your Bibles, the caption will just say friends, and she sends them on a search and recovery mission. And she says, go find Solomon, go find him. and Tell him I'm crazy about him, tell him to come home. If Solomon did anything right in this situation, it was that he didn't force his way in. Gentlemen, even in a marriage, when a woman says no, it still means no. So if he did anything right, it wasn't that he, he tried to say, well, I'm the king. You're my wife, woman. We've got a license here, and according to the word of God, he didn't quote a verse. He didn't try to push his way in. If he did anything right, it was he didn't force his way. If he did anything wrong, was he left, and he didn't deal with the conflict. He just walked away. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Let me tell you what that word foothold can be translated into. It can be translated into a guest room. And I thought, man, that's beautiful, especially when you're looking at families. Don't let the devil in your house. Don't give the devil a room in your heart. Don't, give, don't invite him in and give him a place to stay. Don't let him take up residence in your family, in your relationship, in your home. Don't go to bed angry. So here's what happens to Solomon and this, and this Shulamite woman. Uh, he shows back up. They make up and uh, they start talking that love smack again. He starts telling her that she's got hair like a goat. and uh, She's got teeth everywhere there should be one. And they're nice and white. And then he says this in chapter 6, verse 11. I went down to the grove of nut trees to look for new growth in the valley to see if the vines had budded or the pomegranates uh, were in bloom. Before I realized that my desire set me among the royal chariots of my people. Some of you uh, very well could be, chances are really, really good. You're in a tough place right now in your marriage. Maybe things started off good. Maybe the honeymoon lasted for a while. But some of you would say this morning, you know what, honestly, I, the honeymoon's been over. And maybe the honeymoon's over because there was an argument that happened a long time ago that was never resolved. You just never really dealt with the conflict. And maybe you ran, and maybe every time your, your response to conflict is simply to just leave. In fact, I've heard people over the years say, you know what, it's just better, it's just better that I leave. Sometimes you need to cool off a little bit, but you have to deal with your junk. Maybe you haven't had uh, a date night in a while. Maybe it's been a few weeks or a few months or, God forbid, even years, and the fire's gone, and you're wondering. You've allowed your, your schedule to take over your life, and the occasional overworking has, has become a lifestyle. Maybe there are just some unmet expectations, and you're just not sure if you love each other anymore. What do you do? There actually some, is something to this Jesus stuff. 
the reason that I follow Jesus is not just so I'll have a place to go when I die called heaven, but that I understand that he loves me and that he wants what's best for me. And that there is power this, that we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks, this thing called resurrection power. And that when I go to him, that he actually cares about me and he cares about my marriage and he cares about me as a father. He cares about me as a husband. He cares about my wife. He cares about her relationship with, with, with me and her kids. And the beautiful thing about those of us that follow Jesus, it's more than just a Sunday morning kind of thing. But when two folks will, will come together and seek the heart of God, if we'll model Jesus, if we'll model his mercy and his grace, then there's hope. One of the incredible things that I've been able to see here at this church over and over and over again is that God some, do some of the most phenomenal work, some of the most phenomenal miracles that you could ever imagine if you'll just trust him. So maybe there's some of you this morning that you'd recognize that, you know what, there are some unmet expectations. Maybe I've been walking away when I should be staying at home to work things out. Maybe there's some of you that would say, you know what, honestly, I've just been self-centered. It's been all about me. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. If that's you, and there's just been some struggles, if that's you, and you would say, you know what, I don't, I, I can't own it all, but I have to own my part. And maybe all the tension has been focused on me. And I, I just, I would just appreciate you praying for me. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? Thanks. Anyone else? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see it. Thank you. Father, I do just want to take a moment to pray for uh, struggling couples. I want to pray for husbands and wives, Lord, that uh, think that somehow that conflict shouldn't be. shouldn't happen with two people that are devoted to you but Lord we're human and sometimes that selfish nature in us takes over and we have those unmet expectations and Lord we so forget to focus on anybody or anything else but us so Lord I pray for hurting husbands and wives this morning God that you'd overwhelm them with your, uh, your presence, your spirit Lord as folks are just honest and maybe even confessing that you know what they've been selfish and that they feel that need this morning to confess that and they need to die to themselves so that you can live through them so that you can display to their spouse mercy and grace and love every head still bowed every eye still closed maybe there is a conflict this morning and that conflict really is between you and God and uh, maybe you just feel like God let you down somewhere maybe God should have done something that he didn't do and maybe you have a grudge or a struggle or a conflict with Jesus and I'm talking I'm just talking to some followers of Jesus that you've just let these issues come between you and him and you know what you really haven't spent any time talking to him about it so maybe that's just what you need to do right now is just, you know, just pray. Say, you know what, God, I, the same principle applies. I've let something small turn into something big and create a distance between you and me. So maybe you just need to pray right there and say, Lord, I need your help. I want to die to me and I want to be open to whatever you want to do or say to me. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus and you certainly understand the conflict that there's been between you and God. And Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit is just showing up in a sweet way 
and he's just kind of drawn you to himself and you don't know really how it happened because God is just God and he is so good and he loves you more than you could possibly imagine he's absolutely crazy about you and what he desires is a relationship with you so how, how do you know how do you know that he he, he desires a relationship with me. It's, it's because of the cross. It's what the cross said. It's just not words on a page. It's not this thing called the Bible. It's the act that God sent his son. It's the act that Jesus, being the son of God, went to the cross. And on the cross, he died. And he shed his blood for your sin and mine. And it is the fact that he was raised on the third day and he's alive. And what he desires this morning is a relationship with you. A life-changing, life-altering relationship with you. If you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus and you'd like to be, then maybe you just pray a simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe. I can't understand it all. I can't explain it all. But I, I'm, I'm choosing to believe. Jesus, you are God's Son. And I know you're alive. And as humbly as I know how, I'm just this morning asking you to forgive me of my sin. And I'm surrendering my life to you. From this day forward, I am no longer my own. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your persistence. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the power of your word, God. We thank you that you love us. And God, that our relationship with you is real. And God, the same kind of principles that we apply in our relationship with you, we can apply in our relationship with others. Lord, thank you. Thank you, God, that you cared enough to take a relationship like with Solomon and the Shulamite woman. And Lord, that you put that in the context of Scripture. And Lord, while those of us that share your word on a weekly basis might be a little bit afraid of it it was written God for a purpose and we're supposed to share it so that Lord the intimacy between a husband and a wife can be everything that you intended for it to be thank you that you care enough to deal with the subject matter that God honestly kind of makes us a little bit nervous sometimes we love you and it's in the sweet name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. As you go out this morning, make sure you grab one of these tickets. Invite as many people as you can. You don't want to miss the carnival next week. And you don't want to miss Easter. Love you. Have a wonderful day. Bye.